On today's episode of the Relentless Leadership Podcast, I get the pleasure of interviewing an incredible entrepreneur and a relentless leader, the king of Australian coffee, Philip DeBella. Philip started his company with $5,000. He exited DeBella Coffee for close to $50, $50 million. And more than anything, he's a man of character, a man of passion, and an incredible leader that is all about his people. You're gonna get some great knowledge in this episode. I cannot wait to share it with you. Guys, welcome to Relentless Leadership. I am absolutely pumped for today's guest. He is Australia's king of coffee, an incredible entrepreneur, and an incredible leader. I wanna welcome Philip DeBell to the show. How are you doing? Hey Andy, thanks mate. That's a big intro, my friend. You got a lot of energy there. <laughs> mate, you deserve it. Trust me. I think you I think you could match my energy easily with the achievements that you've had. But again, thank you so much for joining me, mate. I've been really excited. I've been a huge fan of yours for a very long time. I've definitely enjoyed your coffee for a very long time. As you can this is where I get the energy from, by the way. Obviously lots of coffee throughout the day. But uh, but what you've done, mate, is truly extraordinary. I mean, you've, you, you're really living the entrepreneurial dream and you're, uh, you're an inspiration of so many people. Can we start with your story? How did it begin for you? Because I know it was humble beginnings into something really incredible. Can you share how it all started? Yeah, totally. Look, I'm a um, son of migrants. Um, my parents love coffee. Um, I grew up as a young age from the age I could reach the stove. My dad was telling me that I had to make the coffee um, and it was just relentless I mean after every meal he'd want a coffee right and, and that's how I got exposed to it but in short what I saw was I saw relatives coming over I saw you know we'd go visit relatives and the first thing that goes on the table is coffee um, from a young age I got to work on an espresso machine in my brother's pizza shop I then went to work for the a cafe that roasted its own coffee so this whole love affair with coffee um, was all around that but my real love affair was all about entrepreneurialism it was always you know, back then, no one called it entrepreneurism, right? They, mm. you, you called it a pain in the ass problem. <laughs> Seeing a little kid walk around asking so many questions and, yeah. um, you know, and being so inquisitive. And, and I was always interested in the mechanics of how things worked. And, mm. You know, and I was always in, in, inquisitive about self-betterment and how do I, you know, how do I become a better version of myself? Mm. And, and um, the most powerful thing of my upbringing and how it all started was that my dad used to work on Sundays. So I only saw dad on Saturdays because he had Friday, Saturdays off, work Sundays because um, it paid double time. Mm. So I come from very humble beginnings. My parents only ever owned their own home, uh, which was a mean feat in its own own right, especially with how they brought the children up. Yeah. And the one thing that I learned was values. Mm. Um, so the, the values that I was taught from a young age really set me up for um, the future and, and, and obviously now. So mm. it's some of the stuff that I love sharing with people is you've got to make sure you get those values right. And if you've got kids of your own, as I have, um, make sure that you're spending a lot of time with them um, and exploring and communicating with them because what you're doing right now is shaping their future. Absolutely, absolutely. So I believe you, I mean, you started, as you said, from humble beginnings. How did you get the business off the ground? Because I know you didn't start with, you know, millions of dollars injected into your business. I mean, you grinded and hustled and you did whatever it, whatever it took. Yeah. Tell us about that, that initial stage. Yeah, well back then, I mean, the world of evolution is fantastic, right? And today, every startup that looks for an investor. I mean, when I started 15 years ago, no one, you know, yeah, there was people that might have invested, but that wasn't the go-to, right? Mm. Um, what was, was that I had a business idea that revolved around solving problems. Mm. Um, and the problem I was going to solve was I was going to turn a product industry into a service industry. Mm. So copy only ever got sold as a product. There was no service behind it. There was no training, business advice, helping cafe owners make money. And that became our purpose. Our purpose became, how can I help a cafe owner make money? money yeah. and the way I got paid to do that was through the transaction of coffee mm. so I actually didn't focus on the sale of my product I focused on the process on what I could do to help a cafe and make money mm. um, and that would be the same advice I'd give anyone in any industry mm. is have a look at the industry research the companies that have failed understand why they're failing mm. um, and have a look at the better way to do things mm. um, it's something that I do now in any other business I'm involved in I look if there's a problem if there's a problem there's an opportunity yeah um, if there's no problem there is no opportunity mm. I got to spend some great time with Richard Branson a few years ago at his place in Necker Island mm. and he told me about coca-cola he told me about how virgin cola tried to take it on but couldn't mm. He told me about why Virgin Bank failed in Australia. Mm. Um, and the common theme was that there was no problem that he could solve that would make him more relevant mm. than the, the original companies. Yeah. There was no gap in the ceiling. When I started, the gap in the ceiling was service. Mm. It wasn't coffee. There was great companies doing good coffee. Um, but no one had positioned themselves as a, as a service business. Mm. So my advice 
from what I've learned so far is mm. to make sure that you position yourself to solve problems. Mm. Um, and if you're asking yourself whether I should be going into business or whether I'm doing a good job or how do I stay relevant, make sure that you're constantly, constantly doing a SWOT analysis mm. on the industry, on your business. Mm. Um, and, and with that, it's people want to focus on their strengths. I say to people, park your strengths. Mm. Focus on the weaknesses that exist, whether it's the industry, whether it's the problem, whether it's relationships. Mm. Focus on how you're going to solve those weaknesses. Mm. Work out how you're going to capitalize on opportunity, and that's how I've expanded across so many different countries and different business. It's been very strategic growth, but it's been all about capitalizing opportunity. Mm. Mm. And then some of it's come about by neutralizing threats. Mm. So I started a green bean business because I saw that the roasting coffee business was becoming flooded. And I said, everyone wants to drive race cars, but who's actually providing the petrol? Yeah. So I started a business called International Coffee Traders, which I still own, mm. right? So ICT.coffee. And what that business does is that it actually supplies the fuel to the cars. Mm. So I sold my car being developed coffee. Mm. I sold that but kept the petrol. Mm. So now I'm solving problems for, for coffee roasters by giving them advice, helping mm. them make money. And no one's ever made the transition from being a roaster to a green bean supplier. Mm. But that came because of opportunity. Mm. Um, it became because of threat. So mm. really, really embrace the concept of SWOT analysis, mm. but understand that you need to park your strengths, know what they are and park them, work on your weaknesses, capitalize your, on your opportunities mm. and, and neutralize your threats. I love that. I love that, Phil. Obviously, you, you're an incredible leader. I mean, there's no way you could have built you know, develop coffee at the rate and the size that you did. Of course, you exited and now you're, you're running, I think you're running multiple different companies, which is really exciting. I've seen you've been over in the US and doing awesome stuff everywhere. Tell us a little bit about leadership and really what it means to you, because again, this is the sort of message I, I want to get out there. What is leadership to you first and foremost? Yeah, leadership is the ability to be able to create followers. Hmm. Very simple. The best leaders in the world know how to create followers mm. because unless you're a self-professed leader that stands out the front like a lot of politicians, right? Mm. Um, I'm a leader, I'm a leader. When they look behind them, there's no one there, mm. right? The one thing that I always said is that I want to lead from beside or behind. Mm. So I set the vision out in front mm. and I lead from beside people or behind them. Mm. So my job as a leader is to set a vision, mm. provide the parameters of the banks mm. of the river, mm. and at times the banks will get narrow, at the, the times they'll get wider, but then more and foremost is to support people to move towards the destination. Mm. Now you've got to understand that sometimes people are going to go on the left-hand side of the bank, mm. sometimes they're going to go on the right-hand side, some are going to go dead straight. Mm. It doesn't matter. Mm. As long as everybody's going in the right direction, everybody's entitled to their own style. Mm. So to me, the best leaders bring out the best in people. Yeah. Right? They understand that without people, you can't create magic. Mm. The best leaders care about their people. Mm. So remember that the whole of person turns up to work. Mm. So I have a list of all my people, what their professional goals are, what their family goals are, and what their personal goals are. Mm. To me, that is so important that people understand that a whole of person turns up to work, mm. not just the professional person. Mm. So a lot of organizations are out there honing in on people's professional skills or professional capability, mm. but yet it's what's going on in their personal life, their private life, their family life, that is often going to influence how they perform work. Mm. So great leaders have the ability to care about the whole of person mm. and bring out the best in everybody. Mm. I love that, Phil. So, so true. Really, really powerful as well. Do you believe that leaders are made or born? Both, mm. both. Just like I don't believe every leader needs to be a charismatic, extroverted yeah. nut. Yeah. I mean, something that people wouldn't know about me is I'm extroverted in the company of people mm. that I know. I can be extroverted in podcasts and interviews. Yeah. Yet, if I walk into a room in a social environment, I don't know people, I'm quite introverted. Mm. Now, mm. often that gets mistaken as arrogance. Mm. Oh, he's very successful, but we know who he is, and mm. he's just being arrogant. It's actually not arrogance. It's mm. actually the introvert in me around new company. Mm. And then one time, meet people, and I warm to them, and they warm to me. I'm as extroverted as it comes. Mm. However, I'm quietly introverted in the company I don't know. Mm. Leadership is the same thing. Mm. It's not made or born. What you're born with is DNA. Mm. You can't change DNA. Mm. But you, what you can change is the values you have. Yeah. You can change the process about which you go about things. Mm. Right? Um, and I'll give you the classic example. Mm. Is that they've done studies about an abused child mm. as a childhood. Either becomes an abusive parent mm. or becomes the best parent in the world. Yeah. Now, that's not born or made. Mm. That's influence around you. Mm. That's choice that you make. Mm. So you might have been brought up with the DNA of being abused, mm. right? Or come from an abusive line of, of, of you know, of um, generations. Mm. But you still have a conscious choice of whether you want to be mm. the best 
parent you can be yeah. or whether you want to follow you know the history that stands behind you yeah. you know that's a choice leadership is the same mm. you can either choose to be a good leader i mean i worked in a place that had bad bad leadership for nine years mm. and i always attribute a lot of my success to those nine years of terrible times mm. if mm. i hadn't experienced that nine years i don't believe i'd be the quality leader i am today mm. because mm. i wouldn't know any different i would only know how to be an imposter um learning from other people what i actually learned the most from was learning from being in an organization for nine years mm. that I believed had so much potential but didn't capitalize on. Mm. And by, by analyzing what I believed they did wrong, I was able to create strategy and opportunity mm. to go out and do my own thing. Yeah. If you think about it these days, people don't want to spend nine minutes in an organization they don't like. Mm. Oh, I don't like this, I'm not coming back tomorrow. Yeah. You know, the resilience today is not what the resilience used to be. Mm. And so people say, you know, what's the silver bullet? Well, there is none. Mm. But if you got close to a silver bullet, it'd be how you emotionally engage in everything that you do mm. and how everybody emotionally engages with everything that you do. Mm. If you can get the concept of emotional engagement at the focus and forefront of everything that happens, mm. then you are going to be able to control situations. Mm. I love this, Phil. You're talking my language, man. It's really, really powerful. I can see how passionate you are about this and obviously it's made you very successful. I would love to know about a defining moment in your life. I mean, there's. I feel like in every hero's journey or every entrepreneur's journey, of course we evolve as people, our, our values evolve, beliefs evolve, characters evolve. When was there a really defining moment for you as an entrepreneur and what was it and why was it so defining? Yeah. Mine would have been when I, when we, we started 2002 and we're doing really well in Queensland mm. after a couple of years. Mm. By 2005, we'd, we'd, we'd done extremely well in Brisbane and I was looking at what's next. Mm. And I thought, you know, being the brazen person I am, I thought, I'll go to Melbourne, coffee capital of the world. Mm. And I thought, we're going to just replicate and do really well. Mm. I get to Melbourne, I spend a couple of weeks there and people are telling me what sort of idiot thinks I'm going to buy coffee from Queensland. <laughs> I thought, but you love my product. Yeah. yeah, your product's great. Oh, you love my processes. Yeah, they're great. But why would I buy coffee from Queensland? Mm. And so I sat back and that was a defining moment because just because it worked in Brisbane didn't mean it was going to work in Melbourne. Mm. So I had to take a look at the business. I had to do a SWOT analysis on the business mm. and have a look at what my strengths were. But I couldn't focus on the strengths because they didn't give a shit. They didn't mm. care about good coffee. They didn't care about fresh roasted. Mm. What was the weakness in what I was doing? Don't have a brand, mm. um, you know, um, all the rest. Don't have a legacy. Mm. You know, Melbourne's a very big market. Mm. Mm. What's my opportunity? I've got an opportunity to work with owner operators, right? What is the threat? Well, the, the other companies are going to try and squash me. Then I came back to opportunities again and I went, hang on a minute, what problem am I going to solve for the cafe owner? So I stopped making it about me mm. and I made it about the cafe owner. So I started to ask cafe owners, instead of going in trying to sell my coffee, I started to say, I just want to do some research on what your biggest problems are in the cafe industry in mm. Melbourne. Mm. And they started to tell me staff training, staff training, recruitment, um, network, suppliers, mm. um, not having the power to buy in bulk. Mm. And I started to build what today is now revolutionized as a service company. Mm. So Melbourne was the defining moment behind the Bella. Because in Queensland, I just had to serve great coffee, freshly roasted, with, you know, provide a bit of service, and that was it. When I went to Melbourne, I had to build this complete new model mm. that I then rolled out Australia wide, mm. and our growth just went crazy. And why was it defining? Well, one, it was a turning point of building a small business into a big business. Mm. But it taught me a lot about, you know, people. Mm. And that the moment that you actually start asking the right questions, you get the right information. Mm. And so that's why I say to people, great leaders ask great questions. Mm. The quality of leadership right, comes about in how you go about things. How you go about it will be defined by the questions you ask so that the data that you collect. Mm. You know, and that was why it was a defining moment because other people would have just given up. And trust me, I felt like giving up a few times. Mm. It only takes a few slaps in the face sometimes <laughs> right, to be demoralized. Yeah. But you know what? Passion is resilience, mm. and the most passionate people in the world are resilient. So mm. if you want to know whether your children are passionate about something, they don't give up. Mm. So that's what defines the difference between a passionate entrepreneur mm. or just a person trying to make it big, mm. is that the passionate entrepreneur gets knocked down, gets up, and keeps getting back up until mm. they make it. And it doesn't mean that you keep doing the same thing you know, and not changing it. Mm. You keep spinning the Rubik's Cube until you get the right match. Yeah. And the moment you get that right match, mm. you go. Mm. Mm. I love it. I love it. So powerful. You, you mentioned obviously the few slaps in the face and, and again I agree resilience is so crucial and, and part of business, I mean you know, I've been on my business journey for over six years now and there's so many ups and downs and there's moments where you think the world's about to cave in on you. It could be, could be money, it could be people, it could be all, of, all different problems but I, for me personally I love reading about 
great entrepreneurs, bad times, their struggles, their pain. And I learn from that and I take that on. And I'd, I'd love to know from you, I mean, is there been any really effed up moments where you thought, holy shit, the, the train's about to crash. But yeah, cool. because of that, you know, you became a better person, you, you, you proved resilience and, uh, and you are who you are today. Is there a story you could share around that? Yeah, for sure. There's two of them, right? Mm. And um, one of them, and the, and, and the most important one was that um, you get on this tangent, you're doing really, really well, mm. Um, mm. and you think, great, I'm, a, I'm invincible, and you start to forget about bringing everybody else along for the journey. Yeah. And one of the things we forgot was our, you know, our accounting software. Mm. So we blew up QuickBooks. Mm. We were using QuickBooks. Yeah. We were so focused on what was going externally, we didn't look internally, mm. and QuickBooks blew apart. So we lost all the data, the information, mm. the invoices. Um, and we had to go from QuickBooks to SAP. Mm. Now that's like going from a Holden Gemini to a Ferrari, right? Yeah. Um, not only in cost, but in training. And so the business then lagged because we didn't make sure that the back end met the front end. Mm. And what I talk about now specifically, the lesson learned there in an analogy, is imagine walking into a 100 seater restaurant mm. and there's five people taking the orders, but mm. there's only one chef in the kitchen. Mm. Mm. So my biggest advice in learning today is always make sure mm that you, the back end of your business meets the front end. Mm. Make sure that you're always working to the lowest common denominator mm. in your business. Mm. Make sure that the gap between you and the rest of the team is as small as you can get it. Mm. So when we built the website, we made sure that to navigate the website, we got one person from the company that never used a website. Mm. And they were our benchmark, because we thought if yeah. they could use it, yeah. we've made it that simple that everybody's gonna get it. And we built one of the biggest e-commerce sites in the country. Mm. Um, so that was the lesson learned from, you know, from being in a hole, mm. because of course you lose all your financial data, you lose yeah. all your invoicing, we're lucky we've got honest customers, mm. so they don't pay their bills, you've got no track record of it. Yeah. And then the other one um, that sticks out is when um, one of my great loyal employees decided to go in competition against me. Mm. And that was a learning curve, because mm. you invest in so much people, and a lot of that would have broken somebody. Mm. That would have morally and emotionally broken someone, and I bet you there's not one person that would be listening to this mm. that hasn't been through the break of loyalty in one way, whether it's business, professional, yeah. or family. Yeah. And what I learned there was to take the ego and emotion out of business, mm. as difficult as it is, mm. especially for a crazy Sicilian Italian, <laughs> right? Get rid of that ego and emotion and park it. There is no place for negative ego mm. or negative emotion. There's plenty mm. of place for positive emotion. Mm. No place for negative ego or emotion in a business mm. because you start to make stupid decisions. Mm. You start to make decisions based on things that you shouldn't. Mm. So when a long-serving employee decided to leave me and go in competition, I had to make a choice. Do I then say, I'm not looking after people anymore, they just throw mud in your face, you know, all the cliches? Yes. Or do I isolate and say, this is one person, mm. they're out of the company, mm. now mm. let's hire somebody better and more dedicated, mm. right? So in short, what I learned was choosing your attitude. Mm. Mm. It's gonna be plenty of negative that happens in our life if yeah. you don't choose your attitude, you're in trouble. Because I tell you, the decisions we make when we're in a happy place compared to the decisions we make when we're in a bad place mm. are completely different. So anyone that's not in a good place right now, work out what it is, work on that before mm. you make any serious decisions. Mm, I love that. Yeah, super, super powerful. And again, a great lesson for anyone thinking about going into business or in business, because it, it is bound to happen. You know, as I hear you speak, Phil, you, you clearly, extremely well educated, really smart guy. I notice a lot of the language you use. I mean, you, you're in tune with emotional intelligence. You're you know great with leadership. Are you, you know, what are your thoughts around education, self-education and growth? Do you have rituals around that? Are you passionate yeah. about that? Can you share a bit about your, your, your views on education? Yeah. Mm. yeah, for sure. So I love the whole concept. So a lot of stuff I've been doing the last 12 months is around growth mindset. Mm. So growth mindset versus fixed mindset. So Carol mm. Dweck mm. Um, is fantastic. Mm. Some great TED Talks, some great YouTube stuff. Um, and this whole concept of making sure that you're constantly in growth mindset, mm. that you know that you're looking at, at stuff a little bit different from a positive perspective. Mm. And then taking it one step further and making sure that everyone around you is working on growth mindset. Mm. You know, keep that negativity out. Yeah, of course things are gonna happen. I don't like the rah-rah club. Mm. I don't like these self-professed coaches mm. and you can do it and cliche <laughs> quotes. You know, most of the people doing that stuff, mm. unfortunately, haven't made it in their own right mm. in a different business. Mm. Yeah. Their business is coaching or speaking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. To me, the best coaches and speakers are the ones that have actually achieved something. Absolutely. You know, not the ones that are able to get money from somebody's pocket put mm. it into their own. Yeah. Right? The people that have gone through hardships. Yeah. So, you know, the best coaches in relationships are the ones that have had the worst relationships. Yeah. The best coaches in business are the ones that have had success but also had 
negative things happened. Mm. The best coaches aren't the ones that set up a coaching business mm. and had, had never done that. Mm. Just like the best political advisors are not the advisors that come out of uni that are 21 advising politicians on policy. Yeah. When do they ever build policy? Mm. So I'm very pragmatic in my approach. Mm. That's why I love the workings of your Carol Dweck, you know, people that mm. have actually been there. I love looking at Richard Branson's stuff, mm. right? Mm. I spend a lot of time reading briefs on companies that failed. Yeah. Because if you can identify why they failed, if you can look at the purpose and the why, mm. Simon Sinek is another great one. Mm. His whole concept of the why versus what and how, mm. you know, is, is very, very powerful stuff. You know, Gandhi's work around being part of the change you want to see. Yeah. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of stuff around stoicism. Mm. So looking at the values of stoicism around strength and courage and justice and mm. wisdom. You know, so I get my learnings from a multiple range of areas. Mm. I love looking at businesses that are failing. I love talking to people about problems. Mm. You know, what are your problems? How can we help solve those problems? Mm. Um, what we forget to do in today's society is just communicate. Yeah. Yet I believe that the common denominator of failure is poor communication. Mm. So I work every day on how I can become a better communicator. Mm. The other thing we do wrong is that we set benchmarks and once we tick them, we stop. Mm. My benchmark is tomorrow to be better than today. Yeah. So if I'm constantly working on being a better version of myself every day, mm. then the learning is in infinite. Mm. It doesn't stop, yeah. right? And therefore, learning is a journey, not a destination. Mm. I hear so many people say, I'm just going to go get that MBA. I'm going to go get that degree. And then what are you going to do with it? Mm. Mm. Once you've got it, what are you doing with it? Yeah. You know, why is learning a destination? It should be an evolution. It should mm. be a journey that happens every day. And negative is what we'll learn more from rather than positive. Mm. You know, watching other successful people, what you're going to learn from is how to be an imitator mm. and nobody mm. likes fake Louis Vuitton mm. right? mm. or fake Gucci or fake Rolex they want the real deal yeah. right? so therefore learning from people that have been successful mm. is only going to fill one part of your cup mm. Mm. the biggest part of your cup will be filled from learning what things that you should do different or better mm. which is the true meaning of an entrepreneur yeah. is how do they do things different and better but how do they create their own resources mm. so what makes the Debella story fantastic is that I started with $5,000 yeah that is the key to me of what mm. makes it remarkable mm. is that it didn't start with millions of dollars, mm. but yet I was competing with multinationals that were turning over millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, how did I do it? I made myself relevant. Mm. I solved problems. Mm. I looked at the industry and said, how can I do it different or better? Mm. Right? I surrounded myself with the most amazing people mm. with the right attitude. Mm. And then if they needed the skills, we went and got the education or I taught them or, or I brought people in to teach them. But I hired on attitude, mm. always hire on attitude, not skill, mm. right? I hire people that can emotionally engage with others. Mm. If they can't emotionally engage, they're no good to me yeah. or they're no good to themselves. Yeah. I make people care about their personal brand. Mm. Don't care about my brand, care about your brand. Mm. You are the most important person to me because when your brand is perfect, you will automatically build my brand. Mm. So I go things a little bit different. Mm. Um, I look outside the square, but I always look long and play short. Mm. Um, but I'm always working on what I can do better, mm. Mm. right? To me, it's about me becoming a better version of myself every day, mm. you know? And I make mistakes, everyone makes mistakes. And if I'm not making mistakes, I'm not pushing hard enough, mm. but I'm not purposely trying to make mistakes, yeah. right? Yeah. The true meaning of a mistake to me is if you repeat it twice. Yeah. yeah. Because if you if you knew it was a mistake the first time, why'd you do it? Yeah. Right? And that goes for working with people. Why did you make that mistake, you know, if you knew it was a mistake? Mm. So, you know, it, it, to me, it's a very pragmatic approach. It's a common sense approach. I don't think I'm some sort of whiz. I don't think I'm, you know, this um, intelligent Thomas Edison who invented something important. Um, not at all. To me, um, I think I'm very in tune. Uh, I'm constantly assessing, I've got high levels of emotional mm. intelligence, but I'm constantly working on being a better version of myself. Mm. And, 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 and probably to sum it all up, my constant motivation is to be in service to somebody. Mm. So mm. whether I'm doing a podcast or whether I'm um, mentoring or speaking at a school or whether I'm sitting down listening to a friend tell me you know, their issues, I put myself into being in service to them, mm. to, to be able to help them solve their problems, mm. to be relevant to them. You know, or I just don't talk, you know, um, it's not about me, it's about me. Mm. Um, and so I really, really relish in that part. And I mm. think that's one of the things that sets, and I'm not alone, there's millions of people out there that do the same thing. Mm. But I think that's what sets them apart, is that they understand that they need to be in service to somebody else. Mm. And if you think about it, that's what's going wrong with the world, right? People go, what's wrong with our politicians? They, and I do a lot of work with politicians. and mm. They don't understand the concept, not all of them, of mm. course. But the ones that aren't successful don't understand the concept of being in service to someone. Yeah.
so right? true. The government doesn't understand. They're in service to their customer. Mm. You know, Debella Coffee was in service and is in service to its customers. Mm. When you venture in New York, in USA, mm. we are in service to them. Mm. In mm. India, in Thailand, in China, the philosophy doesn't change. Mm. If you're in business, you're in service to someone. Mm. So understand that, right? And rather than think that you're, you know, at the top of the tree, you're not actually at the top of the tree. You're at the bottom of the tree. Yeah. The person at the top of the tree is the decision maker with the money in their hands. Mm. Mm. You put so much into your people and that's so important, especially when you're scaling a business and you're growing to the to the size that uh, that you have. Tell me a bit about how you, like, how important is culture in the company to you and, and why do you think it's so important in, in creating a really great team? Well, it's funny you say culture to me, I um, turn it on its head. Mm. People put, if you've got culture, if you're listening to this, um, don't be offended, it is what it is. If you've got culture statements around your wall, go rip the fuckers down. <laughs> um, because culture is not what you push down people's throat. Yeah. Culture is what people say about your business. Mm. So how do I know I've got a great culture is when I ask people, what do you think about my business? What mm. emotional, you know, what emotional response do you have mm. when mm. you hear the brand? Mm. Um, whether it's my personal brand, a company brand, what's the emotional response? Mm. That's culture. Mm. 15% right, of employees around the world mm. are not engaged in the workplace. Yeah. Yes. Right? You know? Mm. Now, that's pretty scary. Mm. So that's opportunity. Mm. So what happens when you get an engaged workforce? That's why culture is so important. Yes. So what I always said was, I'm going to build an organization where people mm. are so engaged that they believe it's their business. Mm. But in return, I've got to make them feel like it's their business. Yeah. I've got to you know, appreciate them. I've got to give them job security. Mm. I've got to give them job flexibility. And I've got to make sure that they feel part of the family. Mm. Mm. Now, the wants and needs of people and individuals are completely different to everybody else. Mm. So I used to run, you know, records on there. When is their birthday? So every birthday, handwritten note. Mm. Day off for their birthday, mm. right? I used to how many kids they have, what their favourite sports are, mm. Mm. right? So I used to look and understand the people that I had worked for. Do they speak another language? Where, where, you know, what's their favourite food? Mm. Little bits of information that I could grab from people that showed them that I cared about them. Mm. I had a list of all their goals where mm. they wanted to be. Mm. Right? Organizational goals, personal goals, and they didn't have to share it. It was mm. up to them whether they want to share it. Mm. But what in short I did was I showed them an emotional engagement mm. from me to them. Mm. That in turn makes them engaged in my business or it makes them leave. Mm. I've never had to fire anyone mm. because if they're not right for the business, they leave. Mm. You don't mm. need to fire them. Mm. Right? Or everybody else working around them makes them feel uncomfortable mm. and they leave one or the other. Mm. But the bottom line is that you pay attention and care about the people because they're your most valuable asset. Yeah. If I use the analogy of fishing, you can't catch fish without bait. Mm, mm. Your bait's the most important part of catching fish. Mm. In a business, the people are the most important part of getting mm. clients. Mm. You don't have the right people, you get the wrong clients, but you don't get clients. Yeah. So the cultural aspect, which to me is how the emotions in the organization mm. move, how dedicated they are, how passionate they are, mm. how accountable they are, these are all attributes of culture. Mm. That's your barometer to measure your culture, mm. not some bullshit statement on the wall mm. that's rah rah. Mm. You know, we strive for perfection. Mm. We care about you. Mm. How? Show mm. me how. Yeah. You only know if you have achieved culture when you sit down in front of a staff member and say, "What is it that keeps you at this workplace?" Mm. And they mm. say, "I love the way that you care about me and my family, mm. and mm. I trust that if I had any difficulties, I could speak to you about it." Yeah. That's culture. Yeah. When I speak to, an, a, a, you know, and we bring in our customers and interview them all the time, why do you choose to Bella? Mm. Because your people care about my business. Mm. Now, if I look back to the people they're talking about, it's the same people that I show that I care about them. Mm. 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 So it's this flow on effect. Mm. At the end of the day, I don't believe business is complicated. I think mm. people complicate business. Yeah, yeah. You know, people try to make it about all these processes and, and all these systems mm. and, and mm. outsmarting each other and dog eat dog. Mm. And, when all I believe it is, is about how do I emotionally connect with someone mm. to make them want to choose my product or service. Yeah, powerful, powerful. So obviously with, with values and, and really rallying a team together, I mean, I feel it's so important that we're all aligned as a team. So I mean, I've got 60 staff across my business and, and I believe that our values, our set of values really brings us together and, and helps us focus on a single mission and vision. How do you communicate your values to your team and, and, and is that an important part to your business? Oh, totally. I do it before I hire them. Mm. So, um, you know, I vet everyone that starts with me and mm. now obviously it's at the end, but in the beginning it was in the beginning mm. process. And I ask them three questions. Mm. I say to them, where do you want to be in 12 months? Right? Mm. And most people can answer that quite reasonably. Mm. Where do you want to be in three years, which shows me 
you know, um, vision, you know, if they don't know where they want to be in three years or mm. have no idea, they're not mm. forward thinkers, mm. which is important to me, right? Especially certain roles. Mm. And then the one that stumps most of them is the following. What is the one thing I'm going to hate the most about you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to know your loyalty, dedication, yeah. bullshit, bullshit. I want to yeah. know the one thing that I'm going to hate. Yeah. What is the one thing that's really going to piss me off about you? Yeah. And I share with them what they're going to hate about me. Yeah. Right? Because if we can get over that lower common denominator, they mm. hate. Mm. And I haven't scared you and you haven't scared me, yeah. then there's a good chance nine, nine times out of ten we're going to end up just fine. Mm. Right? So I have the tough conversations early. Love that. You know, mm. I do the hard work in the beginning mm. because then mm. it becomes easier later. Mm. Right? If you follow most people, they want to do, they want to fix it after it's broken. How about let's not break it at all? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> what about let's not break it? So I put out, yeah. I said people, I put out sparks, not fires. Yeah. It's very easy to put out a spark. Mm. It gets harder to put out a raging fire. Mm. So how about we stop it at a spark level? Mm. So when there's a spark, but in order to do that, you have to build the trust so people come to you. Yeah. If people trust you, they like you. If they like you, they trust you. Mm. Right? Mm. In my organization, nobody would know who I liked and didn't like personally. Mm. And it did not matter. Mm. 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 Because it's irrelevant. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether I personally like you or you personally like me. It's mm. how I emotionally engage you. I can still help you with personal issues even mm. if I don't like you. Mm. Mm. Right? Because I've got to value you. Yes. And I don't have to like you to value you. Mm, mm, I've got to like you to trust you. Mm, mm, right? So mm. it's just that I look at things a little bit different in that mm, respect. Mm, you know, and, and I don't believe in the rah rahs as I mm, keep saying. Mm. You can tell me all the bullshit in the world. You know what I'm watching? I'm watching your actions. Yes. I'm watching the one percenters. When I'm sitting down with you mm. at a restaurant, do you stop and thank the waiter? Mm, mm. And it's something that people pick up about me all the time. Mm. Phil will stop and he'll Great conversation, thank you, mm. and I'll come back to the mm. conversation. Mm. The way you treat a wait staff, the way you treat the, you know people that normally get treated badly, mm. you know, is going to tell me a lot about who you are and what you are. Mm. The way you are at your worst, at your angriest, mm. at your maddest, mm. will tell me what you're like. Just like when, when people are like when they're being drinking, right? Because mm. mm. they shut that part of their brain off, yeah. and the and the truth comes out. Yeah. So you know, it's little things like that. It's looking at the actions, not the words. Mm, you mm. know, and, and a lot of people talk a lot. You know, mm. we're all getting fancier with our words, and people use cliches, and people are reading more. They're mm. looking at podcasts more, mm. so they're regurgitating other people's information mm. a lot more. Mm. Mm. So, but how do you break all through that? You watch what they do. Yes. So I say to people, what did you do in your last workplace that really left a strong legacy? Mm. And they look at me. Well, what you didn't put one thing into place in your last workplace that was a game changer mm. you know mm. at least in your eyes yeah yeah so so that's some okay well you're just going to go about the motions rather than look at how things can be done different or yes better. right yes. yeah so there's little things that i put in place like that that really help me with building culture mm. that really mm. help me you know connect with people mm. um it shows them my true side mm. it shows them my authenticity which is one of my strongest values yeah is authentic if you think i'm an asshole tell me mm. we won't have a problem yeah where we'll have a problem is if you tell someone else I'm an asshole, but you don't make you nice to me. <laughs> yeah. That's when we're gonna have a problem. Yeah, yeah. Because if I think you're an asshole, I tell you. Yeah. Right? That's the way I am. Yeah. You know, and that's the people that are around me. No. Mm. Feels as honest as they come. You might not like it, but that's who he is. Yeah. And you know what matters to me? What are people gonna say about me when I die? The only thing I'm gonna leave here is my legacy. Mm. And my legacy is important in terms of people, family, and professional. Mm. I just don't want to leave a professional legacy. Mm. I want to leave a personal legacy. Mm. I want to leave a legacy where, geez, that guy could be tough, but geez, he was fair. Mm. He was honest, but he was caring. Mm. Mm. He could be harsh, but he had his best interest. His intention was to always help you be a better version of yourself. Mm. That's mm. what I want people to say about me personally. Mm. Mm. You know, I don't want them to so say, he drove a Lamborghini, he had four cars, he had amazing houses. Mm. That doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. Mm. My cars aren't coming with me, yeah. my Lamborghini's not coming with me, yeah. you know, my <laughs> houses aren't coming with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's coming with me is my reputation. Yeah. And my reputation is not just in business, it's spread across the three areas of your life. Mm. And I think if people cared more about their personal brand and their reputation, then the rest happens. Mm. But mm. Don't focus on dollars. If you get everything right, the money will come. Mm, if you've got mm. the process right, the money will come, mm, right? Mm, mm. If you've got the engagement right, the relevance right, the right people, mm. the money will happen, mm. right? Yeah, Absolutely. I see so many people caught up on success being dollars. Money's a tool. Mm, mm. That's all it is. Yeah. To me, money was about having enough to do what I want when I want. Mm. That's it. Mm. You know, it's not a measure of my masculinity. It's not a measure measure of my success. Yeah. Um, you know, if anything, it creates more problems. Mm. The more money you've got, mm. you know, to me, money is a tool to be able to have the quality of life you want to have. Mm. If mm. you want to drive nicer cars, work harder. Mm. Yeah. That's how I was. 
Yeah. You know, you want to be able to go on nicer holidays, then you have to be able to be capable to make more money to do so. Absolutely. But it doesn't make you a better person. Mm, it mm. doesn't make you any more elevated than anybody else. Mm, right? mm. You know, the emotion connection is not measured in dollars. Mm, mm. Right? A thousand dollar bottle of wine is only a thousand dollar bottle of wine, and it means nothing mm. if it's not shared in great company. Yeah, very true. Very true. It's the company you remember, not the thousand dollar bottle of wine. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I love that, Phil. I mean, your your story is really inspiring. You, as you said before, you started the business with about five thousand dollars. Is that right? You end up yeah, correct. You you exited the business for I think close to fifty mil, something like that. Again, yeah, tell right. us about that that exiting part of of the I mean, it's your name, it's your brand. You put your heart and soul into it. Was it a, a really challenging experience to sort of let go and, and transfer over? We lost it all. Like my identity is attached to this. Tell me about that story. Yeah. Well, I was fortunate that about probably two, three years before we exited, um, we'd done a lot of work with um, a leading strategist called Alan Bonsall, who mm. ended up writing my book, Entrepreneur Intelligence. Mm. Um, and, and he said, Phil, we, it's time to sell, sell, um, separate the Phil Develop brand and the Develop Coffee brand. Mm. So we spent a few years doing that, and that was the tough part. Mm. You know, letting yeah. go of that ego, that emotion, mm. um, empowering people to take make more decisions. Mm. That was the hard part, the mm. two years before the sale. Mm. Um, getting it right to separate the brand. Mm. Um, and that goes for everybody that's been in that or goes through it. Expect it, it's gonna happen. Yeah. If you don't have an issue with it, then you were never totally engaged mm. with it emotionally. So I was lucky to do it two years before. The lessons that I learned is bring in some expertise. Mm. Bring in people that are very experienced in that sort of work, mm. right? Bring in people that you trust that will tell you what you need to hear, mm. not what you wanna hear. Mm. And that's another good form of good leaders. Yeah. They don't bring in people that tell them what they wanna hear. They bring in people that tell them what they, they need to hear. Yeah. That doesn't mean you bring in someone that's going to be controversial for the sake of controversy. Mm. Right? You tell you bring people in that are going to, you can trust they're going to be honest. Mm. And that's what I did. And we separated the brand as difficult as it was. Mm. I brought in more people. I created different seats on the bus. Mm. I added mm. a couple of more layers in to detach me. Yeah. But I did what they call affectionate detachment. Mm. I didn't just wipe my hands of it. I affectionately detached. Yeah. So my questioning became deeper with, mm. with the team. I'd ask them different styles of questions. Mm. A lot more about what would you do? Mm. If you couldn't get a hold of me on the phone right now or face to face, what would you do? Mm. What would be your gut instinct? Mm. So I started to ask a lot of different questions. So I spent two years detaching emotionally um, and in turn detached the brand. Mm. Best thing we ever did because when we did go for, you know, we're approached for acquisitions and we decided to take it, mm. it made the process so much easier, yeah. right? And it also made it more valuable mm. because it meant that the business would go on post field development. Yes. So they're still going strong. Have they dropped some clients? Of course they have, but they've mm. picked up clients in other areas. Mm. Mm. Um, so is it still going in the right direction? For sure, mm. Mm. hands down, right? Mm. Is it a different style of business completely from when I was? No, not completely, mm. right? Is it different a little bit? Yeah, it is, and you expect it to be. Mm. But they're still tra tracking well mm. because the detachment was done prior to it. Mm. Right? So mm. advice for people that want to sell, it's a process. Yeah. You can't just wake up one day and go, I'm selling, mm. because you won't get what it's worth and mm. you won't get what you could get for it. Mm. You know, Set the problems up, that constant SWOT analysis. Mm. Identify where your business is at and where you want it to be. Mm. Take the gap and work on that gap. Mm, and that's mm. what we did. We constantly, and BRW wrote an article about me many years ago about taking the machine gun to your business, mm. not literally, um, you know, but <laughs> sitting down and rapid fire and have a look at where the holes are yeah. in your business yeah. and then work on fixing those holes. Mm. So in short, what I believe great leaders do and what I did through the sale and all the rest of it mm. is that I spent 90% of my time focused on the 10% we needed to get better. Yes. So 90% of my time wasn't mm. about having a big head of what was great 90% mm -hmm. of my time was focused on the 10% that we needed to improve mm -hmm. and so what happened is we constantly improved our business yes. as we constantly improved even through my earnout period we were hitting 15 to 20% net profit growth year on year mm -hmm. which is unheard of when you're already the biggest in your industry yeah right and it was because everything was aligning mm -hmm. Mm. All the work that we'd done was aligning, which meant the business was valued at a much higher, higher multiple mm. than it would have before. Mm. But that was all planned. You know, that plan started, you know, three to four years before the earnout, yeah. so five, six years ago, because it mm. was a two and a half year earnout period. Mm. So it is a process, mm. you know, if you want to get the best for your business, it, you need to strategize. You need to look long and play short, yeah. like I said before. Yeah. You know, not people don't look long enough. Mm. The world is changing so quickly. 
mm. technology, people, expectations. Mm. You know, people say robots will take jobs. No, they won't. Mm. They will just change what jobs we need to do. Yes. Right? Technology will change a lot of jobs as we know them today, mm. but people will create so many other roles. Mm. So you need to be looking long where do those jobs look like. Mm. Mm. You know, when my kids get from 10 and 8 to 20 and 18, look, lawyers today as we know it will be different to lawyers as mm. what it is in, tw- in 10, 12 years' time. Mm. Doctors are already changing. They're already starting to use pharmaceuticals. They're already starting to use, you know, Zoom and Skype to be able to treat patients. Yeah. Pharmaceuticals can now be ordered on, over the, an app yeah. with a, you know, with a prescription and a license mm. rather than going into store. Mm. The world is spinning so quickly. Mm. The people that are looking five to ten to fifteen years mm. ahead, they're the people that are going to succeed, mm. not the ones that are looking twelve months ahead. Yeah. Twelve months is just not long enough to be looking for your business. Yeah. So get out there and look long. Mm. What does the world? Imagine the unimaginable and understand that it will happen. Mm. Because no one thought that we'd be using one device back in 1980, yeah. right? No one thought we'd use one device to get rid of your dictaphone, your mobile, your camera, and everything else you can do, yeah. even pay bills now. Yeah. Nobody thought it would ever be able to do that and look what a phone can do. Mm. In 10 years, we won't have phones. It will be built into our skin. Mm. You're born, a chip goes in, away we go. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. so what, what are you working on to be able to do that? We're mm. going to have a shortage of water. We're going to have a shortage of food around the world. Mm. What are people doing now? Now, it's not going to happen in five years and 10 years, mm. but in 20, 30, 40 years, mm. there will be shortages. Mm. What are people doing now? And it'll be my kids that, that, that are learning biochemistry, that are learning, you know, mm. um, growing and, and manufacturing and learning agriculture and all this sort of mm. stuff mm. and learning about water science. It's the kids right now of what they do and how long they look mm. that are going to make the difference in the world to come. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. So, so true. On that note, Phil, if we could take you back to when you're around 20, 18, 19, 20, and you're starting to learn and, and, and all this inspiration is coming to your mind, what lesson would you teach your younger self in order to really kickstart your career and your success? Um, make sure that you're um, surrounding yourself with the right people, mm. right? Now, what you want at 18 and 20 in terms of relationship, work, mm. Um, mm. family, is not going to be what you want at 30. Yeah. Right. So now I hear about young people getting married so young, getting into serious relationships so young. Now, I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do. Mm-hmm. Just understand that what you want at 18 or 20 is not what you're going to want at 30. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So you know it's it's and that comes back to what I was saying before. Have the ability to look long. Mm-hmm. And at 18 and 20, I didn't look that long. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and there were some decisions that I would do differently based on looking a bit longer, the way I ran my business, the people I was surrounded myself with, mm. all the rest of it. Mm. It's a bit hard to sit here and sort of say I did anything wrong in being in the position I'm in, but there's always something we could have done better. Yeah. yeah. Because I am who I am because of where I've come from. Mm-hmm. So I've reconciled it. But, you know, a younger person, well, wisdom comes with age. Yes. So, yeah. you know, you'd hope that somebody at 18 is a lot wiser. Mm. So the younger person, I was lucky I had parents that spoke to me like an adult and something that I've continued the legacy on. Mm. You know, my, my eight-year-old son will say, Dad, I'm not in the mood right now. I'm having a moment, but it will pass. <laughs> I love that. Moment. Yeah. And this is an eight-year-old. Yeah. He's completely in control. It doesn't mean that he doesn't become an emotional shit mm. now then, right? But he's in control of his emotions. Mm. And you look at it and go, well, it's the way that his wonderful mother talks to him. Mm. It's the way that he's... His mother and his father treat him. He mm. jumps in the car, I drive him to school. Papa, today's question is, and it'll be the most outrageous question, or it'll be the most simplest question, but he's asking questions yeah. and I never tell him to stop. Mm, mm, mm. You know? So the younger version of me would surround myself with people that would help me grow mm, mm. in all aspects, mm. not just want me to go out and party, party, party. Yeah, I love that. Great advice, amazing advice. Phil, before we wrap it up, I've got a little game I like to play. As you know, in, in business, you've got to think quick, talk quick, yep. and uh, this is a game called Rapid Fire. So I'm going to throw out words. You've got to hit me quickly with the first thing that comes to your mind, and uh, and we go from there. Sound good? Yep. All right, mate. Here we go. Coffee. Me. Brisbane. Success. Work. Hard. Money. Two. Team. Important. Love. Always. Leadership. Hard. Car. Ferrari. Beach. Relax. Business. People. Australia. Great country. Donald Trump. Working. Elon Musk. Talented. Future. 
Important. Legacy. Most important. Philip DeBella, thank you so much for joining me on the Relentless Leadership Podcast. Mate, you're doing amazing things. I love watching where you're going and I can't wait to see what happens over the next five, ten years. It's going to be big. Thanks, man. Thank you so much, my friend. Thanks for having me. Thank you.